This is Mitch, and welcome to the 1000houses.com podcast. I have John Sleva on the line, and he's doing some things that I think are, well, I know are near and dear to my heart because I love uh, his, his strategy and his method, and I like the results. And I guess what I could say, uh, the whole world's not into it, you know, so you can still get out there without having to fight tooth and nail. So we're doing our best to make sure that everybody hears about it <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> and uh, gets out there and, and takes advantage of the strategy. But, you know, buying and selling land, even from afar, is a real popular, uh, I'm saying, a real good strategy. It's not a super popular strategy, which why is one of the reasons why I like it. It's not real popular. Um, I like things a little off the beaten path. So, uh, Justin, how are you doing today? Sir, I'm doing well. When you when you said John, I thought maybe he, knew, he he's known me forever because he knew my middle name. And it's uh yeah, it's man, I'm doing well today, Mitch. It's great to see you. No, well, it's been um it, it's been a um a long day of podcasts. Tuesdays are my day, so like yeah. from eight in the morning till whenever. So I'm, this is my last one. I'm, I'm a little bit brain dead, so my apologies if I messed up. But um, oh, I, no, we'll make we'll make it a fun one. Yeah, and you you hit the nail on the head. Land is that that niche and doing it virtual is so kind of far off the beaten path. People are like, there's no way you could buy a piece of land anywhere away from you without actually stepping foot on it. And we figured it out. Yeah, and I know I know that it's it's possible. I know that it's done. I mean, <clears throat> you're not the only guy in that market for sure, but um. There's some really cool guys out there too. And I've seen it from them. It works. You know, a lot of these strategies, people think, well, do this, does, does that strategy really work? Or does this strategy, they all work yeah. if you work them. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. But you've got to slow down, you know, put on the blinders, quit looking at every damn thing that comes across the street. You know what I mean? And yeah. drill down and become good at something. One thing, you know what I mean? First, like mm -hmm. one thing, you know? Uh, today, you know, you say, well, that's easy for you to say, Mitch, you know, you have eight businesses, you're all over the place. Yeah, but I became really good at one thing for like 10 years. I owned it, you know, I yeah. owned it in my town, you know, and so uh, then I just got bored. But um, uh, so talk to us, first of all, a little bit about your background, Justin. Uh, tell us how you got here. Man, it's it's kind of a fun story. Um, kind of like a lot of people, I was in the the corporate world climbing the ladder and, tr and trying to do really well at that but also had that kind of urge to own a, a business on the side and me and my partner from our, our podcast uh, casual fridays rei we had uh, amazon business together and we we're doing dropship amazon everybody that's kind of one of those buzzwords that was around for a couple of years and he was a real estate agent and investor prior to the crash and said hey man i want to get back in real estate investing i was like cool we'll sell the amazon stuff we'll sell it out and start buying real estate together and he's like oh i want to do it by myself so we kind of dove into it separately and it brought us back back to our journey here. And I, I'm not going to say that it was a, a rags to riches store because people often get caught in that, that grind, but I did have a, had a good career going. I was a executive level for a railroad and I got that Friday morning call and I got let go. And at that time we had just started our company, me and my wife did, and I had sent out like 2,600 pieces of uh, mail and we ended up buying 21 properties with that. And which sounds like a cool number, but really it was like five acres, anywhere to 40 acres. And they were recreational pieces of property. We bought 21 of them. We ended up selling uh, 15 of those owner finance and made like 70 grand total, but we had to keep it going. So what's the next move? And, and so we used some creative financing, uh, put some more money back against it. And now we're five years later, 500 plus transactions. And I bought property in 42 states. Wow. So how hard is it? Is it difficult to keep up with all the different laws in all the different states or it doesn't really affect you that much or? Yeah, it doesn't really affect us that much because the way we, the way I buy land, as I use title companies in those states, you know, you can self close land, and that was the biggest thing for me that a, a lot of people didn't realize, and a lot of people still don't, is that you can self close any kind of real estate uh, deal. It's just if you want the title policy or not with it, and do you want an escrow officer to handle it, or you want to just go down to the recorder and send your deed in and have it recorded, and you do all the title search stuff. So once we started using title policies and uh, closing agents in those states, they handled the law aspect for us. All we had to do is send them the contracts and then they'd, we'd sign it together and both they'd handle all that escrow. Uh, so it sounds aspect. like your, your contract is not like a, a board of realtors contract from that state. You're just probably using, you're using a generic yes, sir. short, short minimal pages or one page contract. Yes, sir. We send a one page contract with a one page cover letter because we send out blind offers. 
And so we'll go on. Yeah. So, so, I mean, really, honestly, guys, if someone wants to back out of a contract, you probably just really need to think seriously about just backing off and letting it go. It's really hard to force someone to sell something to you. So the main thing is they feel like they signed something to them. They're off the market, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it's the tightest or the boldest contract ever written, it really doesn't matter. Either the people want to sell or they don't. Yep. And, 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 and if they want to sell, it wouldn't matter if you did it on a napkin. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, uh, sir. The only reason you need it kind of formal is you, you would like to get the title insurance, right? Because I think mm-hmm. you're a fool if you go around buying stuff without title insurance, because sooner or later, it's going to bite you in the ass. I mean, yeah. hopefully, you know, uh, no, that's, and you're, you're right about that. We, as, as we've grown through this over the last, you know, 500 plus transaction, it's, it's, at first it was, oh, it's not a big deal to buy without title policy. I can tell you I've used title policy four times in the last year. And that's and usually it's an HOA that's missed by the title company and they don't get clearance from that. And then it pops up on the sell side because we typically flip a lot of our stuff for cash, but we do have the exit strategy with owner financing. Yeah, not to, not to mention the fact that there's a lot of liars out there when they're trying to sell and they're not telling you exactly who all the heirs are or exactly what happened in the chain of title or that the that the will wasn't probated. There's a lot of little gray things that people can hide behind and say like, Oh, I didn't know, but they all know. And <laughs> you know, you just learn. Yeah. If you leave, if you leave the gate open, a cow's going to go through it. It's just a matter of time. You know, yes, you, you want to wake up with a cow in your pool one day, just leave the gate open. So, yeah. so I like to do things like, and it sounds like you too. You get in a routine. This is how we do it. We always get a title policy. You know, you set your standards and it's yep. just cookie cutter, cookie cutter, cookie cutter, everything different state. Yes, sir. Right. Yep, exactly. Like the hardest thing for people to understand is they hear somewhere, someplace, like a guru will say, oh, it's a title or it's an attorney only state. Okay. Hire an attorney. You don't have to hire a title company. It's just called a different name. Oh, they don't have a title report. Well, yeah, they use an abstract because it's an abstract state. You just, just change the word out. It's, it's the same process though. It's all the same. Yeah. Give or take a few. And once you find someone who knows what they're doing in that state, then they'll guide you through, right? That's your person. Stick with them. them. You're exactly right. Yeah. So, um, Tell me about your first deal. Oh man, our first deal was a, it was a couple hundred dollar deal we bought from the state of Arkansas, and you know bought it for two hundred bucks, to- sold it on eBay for a thousand dollars, which is it's not a those are not huge numbers, but it, it's enough to wet your whistle, right? And so we wrote a no, book. No, about- no, I don't want to blow over this. Justin. Okay. It was like proof of concept. Holy yes. crap! It was. Yes. It doesn't matter if it was five hundred dollars or five thousand dollars or. Or a thousand dollars, right? Yeah. The point was, I just made this system crap a nickel, and it's yeah. exciting. It's yeah. Exciting. And then you crank the volume up from there. And then we went to direct mail, and we and we did, like I said, we bought twenty one uh, properties off that. And so, kind of the definitive moment for in the direct mail side was the type of properties we're marketing to. Those that we're telling you that we we're offering one hundred twenty five bucks an acre. We bought twenty one of those um, and sold them all. And this was two thousand and sixteen. And then I said, okay, I, I sent the same type of offers out elsewhere and got my, I got my ass hammered to me because they're like, we're not selling our property for that much. So I had to take a, a secondary look and see what we did. So we have a phrase we call on our show called a bass boat property. That's the property that is like a recreational vehicle, a camper, a bass boat, a Harley Davidson. It's that thing that guy doesn't really need, but he likes to brag about. And so we start shopping for those markets, a $50,000 property or less that we're offering 30 cents on a dollar. We can owner finance it real easy. We're picking it up, you know, a $30,000 property for 10 grand. We ask for 20 to 30% down and then we'll cash flow it for 10 years. We'll say 10 year note at 10% interest with a $20 service fee. And we just keep them going and just stack them up like that. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's that, that thing, the guy goes, Oh yeah, I went out to my cabin property this weekend or my, my camp, I went and camped on my property this weekend. I went and hunted on my property. And so he's at the, he's at the water jug bragging to his friends. His wife thinks he's the most smartest guy in the world. Cause he's, He's got, he's investing in land and he's, they've got a, they've got a secondary property and we're just laughing all the way to the bank saying, Hey, we love this because we're helping that, that, that person out. Yeah. And, and she's really happy because now he can take all that crap and put it over there and yep. it on her, at her house <laughs> in her garage. So I love, I love, um, seller financing. That's, you know, that's probably what I'm known for across the nation is, is um, is selling my houses on 30 year fixed 10% notes Mm -hmm. and the PITI payments or the PITIS payments are really close to whatever they're paying for rent for the same house across the street. Mm -hmm. So I did a book called my life in a thousand houses, the art of, of uh, owner financing. And 
I also like raw land and what you're doing if it has mobile homes on it, because yeah. no one value, it's the same thing. No one values the mobile home. No one wants to finance the mobile home. So you can change the whole value of the property because you're changed the dynamic because you will sell or finance the raw land yeah. and you will sell or finance that what most people call a hunk of junk called a mobile home, yeah. which I have made millions of dollars off of in my careers. Right. I'll take all the mobile homes and land you can sell me all, yeah. all day long, every day. Y'all just spit on them, walk past them, ignore them all you want. Just give them to little old Mitch. <laughs> just call Mitch. Just uh, call I love me. it. Yeah, we're, we're doing a subdivide in Texarkana right now where we bought 11 and a half acres and we're splitting it down to two acre lots and and one one acre lot but it's a uh, it's got water at the street it's got power there phone lines and that's what they're for is mobile home it's non-restricted out just outside of the city limits of Texarkana for that so it's a, yeah. a fun so, project uh we're, i'm doing my first big bigger development 100 acres into 120 half acre mobile home lots got to yeah. cut a road you know um it's taken me 27 years to get here so yeah. so don't I'm certainly not sticking my chest out and bragging about it. I mean, there's someone across the streets doing a thousand acres and someone figured it out in a year and a half and it took me. <laughs> but, yeah, but, we just, I, I, and, I, and I say this not to say that, but we, you know, we talked about the small little half a quarter acre property that we bought from the state of Arkansas. We just closed last week on 2,424 acres in Sutton County, Texas that we're splitting up. 2,400? Yeah. So oh, wow. we're splitting cool. that one up, but it's going to be 12, uh, there's be 12 ranch ets out of the deal. So they average anywhere for, are there 88 acres up to 250 acres? Um, all have power and well water on them. We have one house on the place, but it's just known for axis and Barbado sheep. So we're taking a, you know, a seven figure property and bringing it down to under the half million dollar mark, because that's where our preferred lender for these guys, that's where he likes them. Cause it's a two page application instead of a full, like 16 page mortgage for them. And it just, it helps streamline the process when you know the people, the right people in the right places to get it done. So that's one we're working on right now. So it's, uh, it's that's fun. That's one of my things right now. We're, we're, we're subdividing some, some ranches, uh, mm. um, and in the, in the mood to find some more, Yeah, almost kind of out of necessity. I mean, the house has got so competitive in town and then the inspectors and the rules and the regs and, you know, with, they're slapping me with fines because I bought a house and the guy before me moved the ceiling fan eight inches, you know, and he didn't pull a permit. <laughs> And they're giving me the fine. It's like, you know what? You guys can have all this. I'm going to go out to the country where I can store all my guns and dynamite and everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's, it's a fun, it's a neat concept. We, we have been doing, you know, raw land for a while, but going in and taking, buying two deals and turning them into 20. And then you have that. And then with the exit strategy of the owner finance piece on the backside. So we've got that bigger one. We've got another section just outside of Fort Worth in Palo Pinto County. Or it's near Grayford, Texas that we're working on as well. So we've got a bunch of those like going on right now, but. So how are you funding this 24 acre or these big kind of deals? Are you, are you pulling that ass out of your pocket or you, you've got someone behind you? Tell me how that structure. Yeah. So one of the, uh, it kind of depends on where we're at and what part of the country, but it's majority of our stuff has been cash. This one actually has a bank backing it and we have a little bit of leverage with them. Um, so we raised uh, $920,000 for improvements and down payment plus first year's payment. And we're on an annualized payment at just a point over a prime. And so when we have release rates in it, so we release it 115% of what we paid for the property. So if I think I, just rough numbers, I think we're in at 1300, we're releasing at 1600 and then everything else after that's profit. And it goes on the market at 2,600 an acre. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, ways to get it done. We're using private lenders until we got it all um mapped out and wells and septics and fences mm -hmm. and everything. And then at that point, the bank would come and come and take out our private guy. Yeah. Uh, which the private guy is usually a little more expensive, but not that much more expensive. I mean, you know, like six or 8%, but the bank will come and take us out at four and a quarter. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Um, everybody's happy. My, my private people aren't charging me any points or anything. Yeah. Just here's the money. Pay me this interest rate. Um, yeah. I usually pay monthly, but in this case, the guy just said, pay me the interest, you know, whenever, whenever you get the new loan and cash me out. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, you can hold a lot of properties when you don't have to make payments. <laughs> exactly. That's what, and that's the, for cash on cash return with the annualized payment, when we use leverage, it's, it's a fun part about it as well. So, so you have a partner in this, right? Uh, that one we have, we brought on, we had six people in that one. No, so. but you have a partner. 
uh, my normal business. No, it's just me. My, I have a co-host that Adam, we have separate land businesses. Um, like you, you said you had eight businesses. Well, I have the cat, they have the media stuff. That's the podcast. And I have a current land company. And then I have one that we do private funding for uh, raw land investors. We do joint ventures where they bring us the deal. We put up the cash and I do have a partner in that company. So just kind of everything's got its own little place and a little niche through our, the, our kind of. Yeah. yeah. So I have sometimes, well, a few, in a few cases, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own. Like my storage business is pretty much my own up here at the lake, <laughs> but every other business I have someone who's really good at some aspect of that business to make up for the part that I don't have. Usually what I bring to these businesses is either some trail of um, clients, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. you know, buyers or, uh, or I bring the money. Most off, most, most likely I bring in the private lenders that know that, that want to invest. So yeah. um, it's, it's a invigorating, it's freeing. It's uh, to be, how long have you been, Financially independent. I've been full time at this for five years. So, can you lay out the the deal that made the most money for you? The, the land deal that made the most money for you? Uh, I'm trying to think. The first the first six figure deal was I, I'm going to two right at that time. So it was like 2017. Um, I had bought a I had so I had a management pension from a first the first railroad I worked at, and when I left, they they were cleaning up their books. I'd been gone about a year and a half, and they offered to pay it out. And I bought 135 acres in Oklahoma, and paid like after quiet title because of some past stuff in the the chain of title. Grandpa left a son improperly, who left to three sons who wanted to pass away. So quiet title, legal fees, and all that. We were in it for like right under 50, and it sold for 157 to the neighbor. Um, so it was a, that was the first six figure deal. And then we bought a, a little eight unit apartment complex uh, off a of direct mail. And it was uh, we bought it for three fifteen, sold it for four seventy five two months later. And I just put in some staircase uh, carpet and a couple of appliance packages. So those were like right back to back. So that was like, right. As you get going, you have two big deals like that. Then you it was just feeling pretty of, good about yourself about then, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. You're like, okay, well we can eat for the next two years. Like we're good now. Let's just, now let's keep going. Let's see what else we can do. Yeah. Someone that can now take the gun away from my head. Yeah. And that's, and I'm glad you said that, you know, cause when you get started and you, and I know that we probably share the same philosophy, you don't want somebody just to quit their job and say, Hey, I'm going to be a real estate investor today. No, you oh, want them no, to get no. up and going, get the money built up to where your passive or your, your net income is, is, is replaced. But there's a, there's a piece sometimes you're forced into it a little bit early. And there is a stress that happens in that, that most people will never understand in their life because I think I've heard you say this before that it's that that paycheck is almost like a drug because you get used to it. It's comfortable and you, and you, you can't, you're addicted to it and you can't get away from it where, you know, when you don't have that and you you're having to take on the insurance, your, your wife and your kids are looking at you because they don't, your wife doesn't work and your kids break a leg or an arm. This stuff happens. It's life. That's just kind of the journey of it. And when you have to shoulder that all and go out and hunt every day for the food, meaning you have to go make that paycheck, you know, you have to get to a point where you can be financially independent, financially free. Yeah, your skin has to get a little thicker. Mm -hmm. your, your nerves have to get a little tougher. You know, I mean, everything everything's kind of ratcheted up a little bit, but there's no greater reward than being in control of your own destiny, having no ceiling on anything you can do. You can mm -hmm. go as far as you want to go, do as much as you want to do. Um, and you can, if you do it right, you can sit down when you want to and take a break and take care of yourself, you know, and yeah. you find a little balance that if you're doing it wrong, you'll have no balance. That's how you'll know you're doing it wrong is you'll be really tired and aggravated and you'll say, I'm going to quit. And then you realize I can't quit. That's when yeah. you've done it wrong. You created a job for yourself. Yeah. You created a job. You got on a hamster wheel and you can't even get off because the other hamsters will eat you alive. You know, you can't, you can't, you got to keep running. So. Yeah. And that was at, at this morning, I was at my kid's uh, award ceremony. I have twins that are uh, seven. So they're in first grade and you know, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning. I'm at their award ceremony and you're seeing the parents looking at their clock, tapping their feet. Like I got to get out of here because I'm about to get in trouble by my boss. And there's little things like that that come up over, over this, this journey or, or this, this freedom you have. And you just sit there and you go, you know, whether it, it, it now it's, you know, land was the avenue that got me here. It could have been uh, owner finance deals. It could have been rentals or flipping, fixing flips, whatever your, your, your thing that gets you here. But 
it really becomes a different mindset. Now you can replace the widget with a Gidget and you you understand the, the machine now, the concept of what we need to do to be successful and what that actually looks like, what that piece of success is and that that time that that you actually get back, that freedom. You know, if I wanted to go have lunch with my wife today, I don't have to check in with the boss. I just go have lunch with my wife and we enjoy it. So do you teach this? Do you, do you, do you train on this? We do. We have a, a training program we call the Land Flipping Blueprint and it gives you basically everything that we do in our business from how to set up your LLC all the way through sending your blind offers, your mailers, how to look at properties, how we do our due diligence, who we use in places, the contracts, forms, everything all together. It's, I think it's 41 videos, just over eight hours. Um, and the videos want, range from 15 minutes. I want everyone to go to 1000houses.com forward slash um, flipping land. Okay. Flipping land. And over there, it'll get them to the show notes. Mm -hmm. Justin, It'll be there. If you have something to give away for them or if they, if they, they, all your contact information, everything about your course, it'll all be over there. Just go to 1000houses.com forward slash flipping land and um, take a look at what Justin has to offer and take advantage of any uh, free stuff they have or free education they have. And, you know, it doesn't hurt sometimes to dip your little finger in and see what these people are up to. I do it all the time and I've got my own thing, but I like to see what people are doing. Sometimes I can use what they're doing to, you know, or some stuff that they're doing. I can morph it over into my strategy and, and help. Sometimes it's like, man, I just need to hire someone to open up this avenue and be my partner on this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I've done a lot of that in my career too. Um, tell us about a success story from one of your students. Oh man, one of one of the fun things for me is that you get to see people's life change, and I and I got two of them, and I'll, I'll go real quick because everybody likes the underdog story, but we forget about how that actually affects real people's lives. So I had a guy; he used my private money company, he used the consulting to pick the area he wanted to mail and kind of get it dialed in. We bid his offers, we sent it, and I hadn't heard from him for a little while. We we bought and sold three properties together in, a, in like a three month period. And, um, you know, he got paid out. He was happy. And then I, I hadn't talked to him. So I just called to check in. I was like, hey, man, I just want to check on you, see if you're getting any more mail going out, if you were going to need some more help. And he's like, dude, I just wanted to tell you, I did this for a means to an end. And I was like, okay, what's the means to the end? Well, his daughter had got taken away in a custody battle. And he used the profits that he did to make to go back and get his daughter. She was in a bad situation. And he got custody, full custody back over. And it was like back from the state for something. And I don't, I don't know all the particulars, but he was in tears telling me the story. He goes, so you helped me get my daughter back. And I know she's going to have a better life because of this. So it wasn't, this was going to change this whole, like I'm going to be the next Donald Trump or whoever it was. You really impacted my life at a granular level that I know my grandkids are going to be impacted by this. And my, my daughter definitely is because her life is going to be out of this bad situation that she was in and into a better situation because he didn't have those means to an end at the time. So to me that those little things like that are what add up, uh, they, they, they accumulate to a, a big impact on society because we can have people doing better now. Um, yeah, well, you know, not everybody wants to be a multimillionaire land flipper and you don't have to do that. Like you know? we talk about, I talk about, uh, you know, 2,500 deals. You talk about your 500 deals or whatever in the last couple of months of land deals. It's a lot of, you don't even have to do that much. You yeah. can use it. Just the main thing is that you figure out how to make some kind of income or positive cash flow that you don't have to go out and hunt every day. Mm -hmm so that you can find out who you are and where you belong and quit your J-O-B so you can free up 2,600 hours so you can be who you're supposed to be and quit giving that 2,600 hours to someone else's family and to someone else's life, you know? Yeah. Um, we all got to have jobs from time to time. I mean, most of us had had a job. So usually we have to have a job long enough to figure out that it didn't work. But, <laughs> that one will fit. Yeah. And I, and well, I guess... I take a little different stance because I, I wasn't, I, I was happy in my career, but I didn't feel as fulfilled as I do now. And the amount of stress level, my blood level, my health, everything is 10 times better now than it was during that time. And so making that transition from corporate hamster, well, I'm going to climb this ladder. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the next executive. I want to be the youngest executive. I want to do all this stuff and basically selling your soul. And, you know, we moved, we lived in seven houses in eight years, me and my wife did, and we had kids and that's not a life you want to raise your, you, your kids aren't impacted positively by that because they're living across the country. They're, they're moving. They don't see their parents. I think as my twins were their first year of birth, I may have helped give a bath three times in their first year. Now I'd take them to school every day. I don't miss a, a dang thing that they, they want to do. My, my newest child who's two and a half or he's about to be three. 
he knows dad at a personal level. He sees dad every day because he walks into my office to see if I'm there working. And if he wants to work with me, he sits in my lap while I do what I'm doing. And so those are the things that really, to me, where these type of shows or these type of inspiration that we give people, whether it's flipping land or, you know, houses, whatever that is, it's, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Yeah. So go to 1000houses.com forward slash flipping land, check out what Justin Sleva has to offer and uh, take advantage of his experience and learn from someone who's already been there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know? So uh, anything you'd like to say to that? I don't know that that person out there that's got the job, not satisfied, doesn't really know what to do, but is going to do something somewhere. What do you have to say to them? I, t I tell them to, it, it doesn't have to copy what you or me do, but look for something that lights your fire, something that gets you excited, something that makes you want to stay up a little bit later and get up a little bit earlier and then go all in on that. And wh whatever that could be, it could be if you're an artist and you want to draw, whatever that is, because there's going to be days where you need that, whatever it is that's driving you to drive you through those lulls or that early morning to get up, because it's not going to be just go work for yourself, do one thing. You have to grow with two things at one time. And it's going to feel like you've used all your brain capacity some days and you need to find that fire that just really lights you up. Yeah, that's what I'm always looking for in my students. I'm looking, number one, I'm looking for, is there, I've had enough of this crap meter. Is it pegged yeah. over in the red? Yeah. You know, if you had enough of everyone telling you when you can get up, what you have to wear, where you have to be, how long you have to be there, how long you can vacation, if you can even take a vacation, can you go watch your kid's baseball game? Can you not mm -hmm. go watch your kid's soccer game? You know, all that stuff. Have you had enough of people telling you about that? And how much money can you make? Have you had enough of them telling you this is how much you can make? You're not allowed to make any more than this. So when you've had enough of that and you find something that you're really passionate about, which means you may, you know, find yourself doing that, whether you were getting paid or not. I'm not sure that house flipping really fits that category, but it makes so much money that I was, uh, you know, uh, really drawn to it. And the, the margins were big enough to get excited about. You don't and, think there was something in the process that turned you on that whether well, it was the finding the deal or the negotiating, there's something in there that got you the, in the, the money. Raw, in the, in the raw, in the raw thing of it, it was showing up with nothing and coming out with a big check, you know, at the end yeah. of two weeks okay. or three weeks or one day, you know, in the beginning, but that, that grows old really fast, yeah. you know, and then, then as soon as you don't need, you know, I, I know of those of y'all who haven't made it to this point yet, it sounds like complete bullshit, but there's a point in time where more money is not going to do anything for you. Yeah. You know, it's really not going to do mm -hmm. anything for you good and or that good. And so you got to have a higher reason to do something. Mm -hmm. Mine is to help renters get out of the rent cycle and become homeowners because that's most the average Americans wealth is is in their home that they own. You know, like 90 percent of their wealth is in the home that they own. So mm -hmm. if you can help renters move over to be owners, then you've done a tremendous thing for those families, whoever they are. And then the other thing is if you can help um, regular people, average people, just people learn how to find their own financial independence through some vehicle, then you've, again, really changed that person's life or that family's life because, you know, it's about 2,600 hours is what I calculate. If you're the kind of person that can get it done, you'll be saving yourself about 2,600 hours. I had some people do the math. They said, well, 40 hours a week is, is, is less than 2,600. I said, if you're the guy that only works eight and goes home, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to make it. You need to be the guy that's trying to free up 2,600 hours because you're only yeah. getting paid for eight hours a day, but you're working more than that because yeah. you give a shit. Because your I give a damn level is like really high yeah. and you really have a lot of uh, um, uh, responsibility for what you're supposed to be covering, whatever that is. And so that's what I said. That's why I said 2,600. It's got to be a little more than just the average guy. Yeah. I figured that when I, the first time I heard you use that quote, I was like, that's not 40 hours a week. It's because you want somebody that wants a little bit more. And that's, and that's, it's, it's, it's somebody has to have that one. We can't give well, it to you. Can't, it's not what I want is if they're going to make it, they're going to have to be that kind of yeah, person. It's, yeah. No, that's what, that's what they have to have. They have to have that want to do more. They, they have to have that. I'm going to make the phone calls or I'm going to make the, 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 write the email or look up that little piece of information because they just don't quite understand what it means. You don't, like you said, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the world. You just have to know who to get a hold of at times. I'm living proof of that. I, mean, <laughs> I want to talk about not smart, like book, you know, not. Yeah. I, what, 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 what I think that you have, and I think what a lot of the entrepreneurs that I interview have, is, is you have a boatload of common sense, mm -hmm. you're right? And you're not afraid to do things. If your common sense says to do it, even if it's kind of against the grain or, or doesn't 
you know, as long as it's as long as it's legal, as long as it's you know not hurting anybody, you can bend all the rules you want, or you can get out of the box. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, yeah, when I started a, buying, we, we did when I started buying houses on my like credit cards, everyone was telling me I was a fool. I, <laughs> I kept going back and go, I'm buying a house worth sixty thousand for thirty thousand, and the only way I can do it is to put it on a credit card. And I kept saying, what's wrong with that? Yeah. And I'd go outside and they'd scream at me and throw, you know, you know, boo me off the stage. And then I would go back in the, my closet again, look in the mirror and go, no, yeah. this makes sense. I'm going, I don't care what they say. I'm going to yeah. go do it. No, I agree. We did a show not too long ago called living in the gray. And it was kind of that concept. There's, there's a, there's a trait that you, you develop and it's, you understand how to bend or make it work for you. And whether that's other people's money, private lenders. I mean, right now, your, 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 your history, you could walk into a bank and say, hey, these are my assets. This is what I have. Put a line of credit on everything. And you would not need another investor for the rest of your life. And you just use the assets you already have, the paper you already have, and run, run off a line of credit and you know, as a wealth management program. Um, but now you've made relationships where these people like to return. You like using their money. It's, it's, we get in those things. But we all learn how the successful people learn how to use the playing field to the best of their advantage, what they, what sings to them, what works for them and how to put it all together in a package that they can deliver on and make money with. Well, exactly. Like to your point, I can go to the bank. I could cash out all my private lenders, but, but you know, what's going to happen in the next recession, the banks are going to close. Yeah. <laughs> they won't loan any money to anybody, not yeah. for anything, not even, no matter how good you are. And so you better not shut the door on your private lenders. So there's a fine balance at my business. Exactly right. You know, I'm paying half of them seven, eight percent when I could be paying all of all of them off with a bank at four percent. But yeah. you got to have these guys in the wings because when the fit hits the shan and, <laughs> and everything's in chaos and the bank closes, you better pray to God you didn't cut all your private lenders off. And they went and spent their money someplace else because yeah. that's the only way you're going to be able to buy these houses at 50 cents on the dollar. Yep, it's I agree. Other people's money because the banks are going to close. Agreed. I say close. They're going to clam up so tight they won't give no. They'll they'll have the open sign. They'll take your application, but they'll find any reason in the world to turn it down because they're just unsure of the time. Yep. Yeah. So during the recession, the last recession, I was buying a house a day. Nice. nice. Yeah. But didn't wasn't any help from the banks they wouldn't even look at anybody right you know yeah so have you been raising private money we have been uh with some of these bigger with the bigger deals we we come in and bring private money and the last one we did was an equity in equity out so if somebody comes in and we it was an llc that was structured for these people doing it so it was six investors and each of them if they brought whatever the percentage of the down payment is they brought that and we hold a little bit of management feedback on that so it's uh, it was a pretty good deal for them on the returns is what we're seeing. Yeah. So this is my only thing with big deals. Some people want to do big deals because they just want to do big deals. So listen mm -hmm. to me out there. If you're doing a bunch of small deals, it's okay. You know, because you can bring six people in and do a great big deal. And it ends up making the same for you personally, as if you just went and got one little deal down the house and didn't have all that crap to worry about. The reason why you might want to do it is it gets you introduced to people and you get used to playing the playing field and people get used to playing the game with you. And, and it kind of solidifies the teamwork, but mm -hmm. you know, don't just go into big deals just because you want to say you bought some big deal or you did some big deal. If it's really not going to make you that much more money than if you just stay small, because big deals can go sideways too. And it can be hard for one guy to manage if it's a really big problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's a time and place, but I like to, I, I kind of get the feeling you're the same way, Justin. I kind of like to go grassroots. I'll move up to another level when I got a certain amount in the bank and I can play it. You know, I, I can, you know, I can ante up. Yeah. You know what I mean? To yeah, a certain we, we've, we've used very little leverage throughout the five years. And, you know, this one, it made sense too with the annualized payment and the interest rates being where they were at. We could have raised all of it privately. And it's, you know, the cash on cash returns look better with that leverage there. And there's, but it's not something that it's like, I would, I would go tell a guy that's never done a deal. Hey, let's look at this and go raise all this private money from people. And you don't even know what you're looking at. And I've, and I've had a couple of those kind of deal reviews where guys like, Hey, would you look at this for me? I want to see if it's worthwhile for me. And it's a, a subdivide and you're going under a power, a, a high power power line easement. You're gonna have to make everything's gonna be a flag property just so you can get the county regs. And it's just, it's not a good deal. And he's like, yeah, I need to get $900,000 for this. And I'm like, there's no way, man, you're, you're buying it at market value for what you're trying to do. And, you know, trying to talk people back off the ledge and, you know, there, it's, there's a right way to do it. And there's, there's some people I'm more risk adverse. I'm, I'm, but I'll make a decision and run with it too. So I, I'll say, Hey, 
I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to underwrite it conservative, but I'm going to look at every angle and make sure I have multiple exits if needed. Yeah, I think that's key. Multiple exits too. Mm -hmm. Check all your back doors. Worst case scenario, can I still get out of this burning house? You yes, know? sir. Is the worst case scenario, can I still get out of this burning house if it's on fire? You better have some back doors. If you can get out and nothing really bad happens, okay, go in. You're taking a chance, but you can get out. But man, when you can't get out, I think that's not it. Next, yeah. <laughs> next, <laughs> yeah. or, or you got a counter with an offer that that creates a back door. Yeah, and, and I think you, you, you you'll, I'm sure you'll, sure you'll attest to this is as you've gotten more and more deals on, as you go from being from I think it was 96 start date, but you know you start to understand it's okay to say no or counter back with what works for you. So you, there's so many deals that are had where you're like, hey, the deal that it's presented to us just doesn't look good. Hey, but I will do this deal if it's say a fifty thousand dollar house and it's not great at fifty, but you know what, at 42, I can make that number work really well. Hey, I'll give you 42 for it. And there's some people, if they're already wanting to sell it and you're there and you're that close, they'll take, they'll, a lot of times they'll come 42, 43, and then you have to decide what your number is. Well, that's what I call, um, I, I love that. I call that never let a deal die on your side of the table. Yep. Always mark it up and push it. Let them kill it. Like mm -hmm. if, if they push something back to me, I, I have to, it's my job to either accept it or then write what I will accept and push it back. I have to just keep making sure that the deal doesn't die on my side of the table. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how many emails I've sent back where it was, here, here is the best number I can do. I hope to do this deal with you. If not, I understand. I look forward to your response. And, and it's on there. It's everything's back in their court. Like you said, we push it to their side of the table. They know where my bottom dollar is. So I'm telling you, this is my last and final. You're not getting me off this. And if, if somebody's usually brave enough to counter back again, Typically, we're right there and I'll go for it. But most of the time, they tell me yes or no. They just, it's a simple yes or no at that point. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, all right, my friend, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on. Again, go to 1000houses.com forward slash flipping land and learn what uh, Justin Sleva has to offer. It's a great way to do business, especially if you're in an expensive market like uh, California or you're someplace where real estate's really expensive. This is a strategy where you don't have to be there. You can buy all over the United States and you can find the places and the markets that are more, uh, more your speed or more the average person's speed so that we can proliferate. So that's another reason why I really like the strategy that uh, Justin's talking about because um, you can do it from anywhere because you don't have to walk on these pieces of land. So... This is Mitch Steven. I'd like to thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to thank all the listeners out there for stopping by to get you some Justin Sleva. Uh, remember, 1000houses.com forward slash flipping land. We're out of here. See you guys.